Um, thanks very much for, for the introduction. I'm actually uh, honored to be here. It's, it's funny because I got a discussion, what is blah, into one of the, of the, of the, the discussion I had with, with people like Ziong and, and Lars. And, and in French, you all know what blah blah is. I don't know whether that translates in any other language but French. Uh, it's very much a French word. Um, but if effectively, we are effectively, when we discuss or publish articles, we are trying to sell a story. It's about storytelling. Um, and at the end of the day, when we want to connect these dots of this publication, it becomes a problem of meaning and understanding what people are describing in their, in their text. And I got pretty much in the field of text mining by serendipity some 18 years ago when I was purely using statistical-based methods to do name entity recognition. That's back in 1999 when I was working at the IP. And at that stage, I was thinking that I could resolve all problem of knowledge representation by purely machines. Uh, 18 years down the line, I'm, I've inherited the Swiss Prod group now for the last 10 years. And for 10 years, I realized that a mix of human and machine learning is the only way forward. And Gary Kasparov said once, when you put the two together, the computer science part and the human, you win. If you antagonize all this, you lose. And that's the reason why I put that title uh, of BioCure AI Sion, because we talk about it a lot about artificial intelligence. And if you follow all the Twitter sphere or any of the tabloids, you will see that people love this kind of artificial intelligence. And I give you a few examples down the line. But I also show you towards the end that we are far away from having an artificial intelligence where we dump all the data and somehow knowledge emerge automatically out of this. Um, but what is quite clear in biology, and I'm a life scientist by training, I'm kind of a hacker by, uh, by design afterwards, is that in biology we've been using microscopes and all these kind of nice, very fancy tools, which were not really digital tools. But what we've been seeing in about a century is that, and you've seen that from people and ads that are on, uh, for professors or for bioinformatician or computational biologists, Every single lab nowadays is praying to get a bioinformatician or a computational biologist in his own limit. And clearly, that transition is something that is across the globe, across the different domains, from life science to other types of domains. But in life science, which has been mainly that type of work where people were doing small experiments with microscope, has transformed and transitioned much more to a digital science type. And a much more computer science heavy type of research. And the joke for all biologists is, and I was kind of a special case as a biology student, because I liked physics, maps, chemistry, and all my friends that did graduate with me hated chemistry, math, and physics. So I was a special case, kind of a zondorfile outside of the distribution, whereas all the others, they chose biology because they were doing this one. Now I would say, in these years, if you start biology, you better have to be good in quantitative aspects, doing chemistry, math, etc. Now, what people wish to have nowadays, that's what you, if you read, is you put everything into the IBM Watson, the ones that won the geo party, and you have an artificial intelligence stuff, and all is solved. Well, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of tabloids, I call that the Kardashian type of science which is, well, you see it, but when you really want to look at the papers, and the good example of the IBM Watson that has been sold to several hospitals, uh, none of them have ever described any of the method below, any of the underlying methods. So there was no scientific paper ever of the IBM Watson ever. Uh, and the problem with when you come into this kind of, of, of areas, when you can't actually judge or evaluate this, this is called PR and not anymore science. And that's where we have to be quite careful when we, when we come in this type of field. But there are good cases. The first good case is actually the AlphaGo. Should I speak much more to the, to the microphone? Yeah, or a little bit easier, but it's really hard to hear. Okay, 
perhaps like that. Do you hear me? Better now? Okay, sorry. Sorry about this. Hmm? Just speak louder. I'm going to speak louder. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, I'm not known to be speaking soft, but I will speak louder. <laughs> um, so one of the examples that I would, I would say is pretty much the, the best one. I, and the good thing of having 14 hours of flight between Switzerland and Japan is that you have the time to watch movies like AlphaGo. Uh, and the AlphaGo is a good example, and a very good movie, if you can look at it, is the documentary with um, Lee Sedol's uh, loss against the machine. But it's not a loss where you antagonize human to machine. It's where you could see that the algorithm really outperform human on certain type of task. Identifying those tasks is the thing that is the most difficult part of our work. And it's also where we need to make sure that people understand where this kind of computer science and artificial intelligence would make a difference compared to what a traditional human with a neural network, which is called the brain, would do uh, at its best. The interesting part, and this is the second paper that came out, but this is actually the one where you always have to, to read the title and then read the text and the full text. This one says that it had no human knowledge, actually it got trained still on some human knowledge. It has some of the rules, but it had a bit of, an, of a human knowledge. So this is also one of the tricky parts when you, when you look at these kind of publications of what is the true underlying truth that is used. There is part of a human knowledge, there is part of the rules. That is, is good for Go, this is good for chess. How about biology? Do we know the role for biology? And I mean, all the people, and I guess the vast majority of people here that are computer scientists, would love to have the rules for biology. As a biologist, I would say, I wish I knew the rules on how things work. That would be so easy. Because we could actually fit that into a data model and we don't touch it anymore. Um, and this is actually something that we've been uh, looking at for quite some time in Swissprot, trying to actually structure the knowledge and what we know about the rules in biology. And exceptions is rather the rules than the inverse in biology. Whereas here, the rules are the rules of Go. You can't play Go in 20 ways. Whereas biology changed the rules. So that's where actually some of this might actually fall out when we come to machine learning and some of the artificial intelligence. And the problem I've seen so far, mainly, are the example of artificial intelligence and machine learning are more what we would, could, would call mechanical Turks, which is a human inside a machine clicking rather than a true algorithm that does the work. And the Amazon is a very good example of that kind of mechanical Turks. And this was a construction that was used by the Austrians several uh, centuries ago, which fundamentally you hit hit someone behind in this that was actually clicking and making the machine works. And a lot of the text mining, and I know that there is a few people on the West Coast, like Andrew Sue, that loves this kind of, 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 of contraptions, but it's a contraption for very simple task. It's not for knowledge, it's really for identification and quote-unquote validation. So it's really a turking, which has its value in itself, but you don't extract knowledge from this. You merely tag things in an accurate manner by a human, and you try to benchmark that against the computer. So, with all this, what I would like just to, to, to highlight in key, in key is, I'm not saying that neither machine learning AI would never work, because I'm very bad at prediction, that's why I'm doing bioinformatics. Um, what I could say is that we have to really manage the expectation. Now, whichever set of data sets which we we'll generate in this case, we need to make them as accurate as possible. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on during this presentation. Now, obviously, we are living in a world where the word data has made a, a major step. And that was, is a, this one is an old, quote unquote, on, on our scale of science, an old paper from 2011 that was just at the hype of big data buzzword, which was actually a cloud tag taking five years of publications and looking at the word usage in all the publication in science. The data is a big word. The ones I'm the most interested in, in the type of stuff, is the knowledge, which is still rather small. So you can have a lot of data without much knowledge. That's pretty much what these slides wanted to allude to. 
I'm, I'm always facing, and that comes when I'm coming in front of the NIH, which is in part funding our activity in SwissProt, or in front of the Swiss government or other type of funding agency, when they say, oh, I've seen, and a lot of people, generally nice people, think that we can solve everything with text mining. And they put that in antagonism to using human to do part of the work. And what I'm trying to say is that there is a middle ground in between where you could use part of the text mining, part of the manual curation. And what the manual curation allows you to do is really to structure the knowledge, both for computers and human, because we cannot exclude people from reading it, but we don't want that only human can read it. So you need to have computers that allow you to do that. And I guess a lot of the linked data and a lot of the topics that we're going to discuss over the next three days, and you've been discussing over the years, are trying to link this too so that it's correctly understandable and interpretable both by a human and a machine. It provides a necessary depth of, of depth in terms of the annotation, and it is updated on a regulated base. And this is actually something which is not something that should be done by the research activity, it should be done by service, and this is actually where we are kind of lagging behind in that, in that aspect on a lot of domains. We're lucky in SwissProt to have received funding for the last 30 years to maintain a resource, so that part is covered in part. We know, however, that doing purely manual curation does not scale. We cannot and we will not scale to all the papers. The question which I'll address towards the end is, should we scale? And how much gain do we get by scaling? On the other side, the text mining, and we've been having a lot of successful work with the group of Ziyang Lu at the NCBR, has been on the triaging of articles highlighting the right set of papers that curators need to take, so that means taking those ones on board to the left, has been really something very useful. And also the rapid creation of corpus, and that has been quite successful, and we've seen that from the Public Attention uh, website. Uh, this has been something which has been used. Now, in SwissProt, and it's really a curation competence center, SwissProt for many years, when I inherited that from Amos some 10 years ago, um, SwissProt was really uh, only focusing on proteins. Over the last 10 years, and I'll show you that later on, we've been actually trying to verticalize our annotation because we know we can't scale on all proteins. It's out of scope to scale and annotate all proteins from all organisms. That's not possible. So rather than doing this, let's do the things correctly on the set where there is experimental evidence and then use computers to propagate any of the annotation on things that we, not a single human will see, but the machine can propagate the annotation. There is billions of dollars that is spent in life science. The bio-curation try to extract, synthesize, and structure these, and I put the, the quotes of hidden, because they are not really hidden, they are in the paper. But they are hidden if you don't know about the paper. It's hidden, that means you, can't, you are not attracted to that piece of evidence. It uses identifiers, ontologies, and vocabularies, and honestly, when I was doing DIP, the database of interacting protein, back in UCLA as a postdoc, I had a hard time just knowing which of the protein identifier I should use because I used the PIR, the gene bank, and the Swiss rot, so I used three, back in 1999. Now there is not that problem anymore, only use one, which is Uniprot. So Census Strict 2, that has also changed from a lot of groups that do their own stuff in their own corner to a much more community-driven type of activities. With a caveat that when you have a community, you need a lot of people to talk around the table. An agreement takes much, much longer than if you do your stuff alone. So that's actually something that needs to be explained also to the funders that it's not happening in a year time or so. You want to have the data being discoverable and reusable. That's, been, that's one of the key critical parts. And my claim is that high quality knowledge resource can really drive the life science. And if you have this kind of resource, uh, you get into a good shape and you can actually help other scientists to do their research correctly. Now, the curators, what they do on a yearly basis, well, that's a, it hasn't changed over the years, to be honest, over the last 10 years. It's in between five to 10,000 articles that are added every year to SwissBot. And anybody that does text mining would say, that's very little. How many people do we have in SwissProt that does curation? 40. That's not a lot. There is 
hundreds of thousands of paper that comes out. So you're not covering most of the paper. I try to convince you towards the end that basically we cover most of the people that matters. And all the rest are called Me Too papers. They do not add anything to the knowledge. They're interesting, but they don't add anything in terms of knowledge. But the fundamental aspect is really transforming these kind of papers into a structured annotation. What we've been doing since the last 10 years, and within the Uniprod Consortium for the proteins, is trying to link that back to all this kind of resource going from the gene ontology that people know about to the Molecular Exchange Consortium, to the reaction based in the chemistry, and that you will see in the next five years a lot more towards the chemistry. Also in reaction to the fact that KEG, that has been created here in Japan, has gone from a non-open source anymore approach to a closed um, subscription-based system. And that created actually an opportunity, but also a risk for a lot of people to not have any more access to a freely open uh, openly database, an open access database. So all this to say that what we have been trying is to use any of the evidence that we do when we do a curation inside SwissProd and propagate that or use the interface and the resource from the other resource to actually write and put the, the annotation in this resource. This is actually rather an inverse problem for most of the people. Whenever they work, they work only for themselves, right? Because you're paid as a PhD or a postdoc. Here what we do is we try to work for the Swiss Prods and the Uniprod Consortium at first, but whenever we have an interaction, protein-protein interaction, that is identified by an experiment, we propagate that to the IMX. And we actually use the IMX interactions database and the interface for curation to actually write that down, which is beneficial to IMX, which is beneficial to us because we can actually cross link that back to our place. And likewise for all the others. So the Uniprot is a consortium, so it's an internationally funded activity, both by the NIH, the Swiss Institute for Institute of Bioinformatics, that means the State Secretariat for Research in Switzerland, and the European Molecular Biology Laboratories uh, in Europe. So it's made up of three groups, and the aim is really to provide the scientific community with a high quality, freely accessible protein sequence and functional information. What it contains in terms of its knowledge is about half a million protein sequences, around 300,000 curated literature reference, about half a million users that use it on a monthly basis. Uh, actually, the good thing with the users is that they are the best to tell us if our website is down. And it's within milliseconds. Milliseconds. Not seconds, not months, not hours, not days. Milliseconds. Um, and there is about 150 resources that either derive or use or reuse the data that is in the Swiss Swissprot. And it's also an Elixir core resource that's only for the European uh, they consider that as an infrastructure resource. Um, also probably because of, I, I tend to joke about Elixir uh, for the Europeans that are in this, in this room, is that in order to know whether a resource is useful, pull it off the grid of the internet and take the time uh, it takes for people to complain. If people don't complain, then it's not really that useful. Or you actually do an inverse exponential to know how much money you give to the, to the resource. That didn't go very well. With the people that are on the funding agency. But that's an interesting uh, approach and an interesting metrics to see if a resource is used. I wanted to show the people that are behind because sometimes there's still the idea of having one postdoc in one place. This is actually a production system, so it's an infrastructure by design. And it's an infrastructure that is led by Alex Bateman at the EBR, Kathy Wu at PIR, myself in Geneva, and it has people that are both staff that takes care of the coordination and leading of the activity, and you can imagine there is a lot of it. Content and curation, this is the vast majority of the people, and a lot of people doing software development or for the, the, the Uniprot, and all the things that goes behind in terms of the website, in terms of quality control, etc., and the curation interface. So it's not a small enterprise to maintain such kind of resource. Now let me go in the next 10 minutes on one example. Now, I'm a biologist. By design, we love one example, and then we do generalization, <laughs> right? So I just want to give you that example mainly just to highlight, and I will not to go too much into the biology, 
because I would, I would probably lose half of the audience or perhaps most of the audience here. But the idea is really to highlight a few key points. This is a, a very nice name for a protein, which is a protein from the cytochrome P450. It's been taken from a paper that originates from Asaka, so it's been discovered in Japan, um, and it's an oxidal reductase. So it's something that transforms compounds into other steroids, fatty acids, etc. So it's an old protein. It's been known for quite some time. Now, those, this protein has been in Swiss Prot for quite some time with these papers just linking to it. That's just the discovery of the gene product. Well, later on, it's been discovered that there is a mutation, a polymorphic mutation of a methionine 433 that actually leads to what is called cumarin resistance. Now, this has been seen in two genetic screens. This is a 2014 papers. So between 1994 and 1999, and that time, that genes had no function whatsoever, but this is pretty much the turn of sequencing human genomes that allows to actually start to see that these genes have an effect on the cumarin resistance and to actually link a genetic cause to a function of a protein. So you have 17 years between. This is actually showing that it's not like writing a book. It's actually something that needs to be updated. Now, there is a 17 years lag between those two discoveries. Well, a year later, two papers came out, which is actually one on the vitamin K. So the understanding of these enzymes being important for the catabolism of vitamin K has been discovered just a few years down the line. So all these papers, we need to actually summarize them, summarize their function inside an entry. So what we do with this, well, we take the executive summary, we write down what is the understanding of the function of the protein. And if you take this protein, for example, and you look at the history, you can see the difference between 1994, 1999, 2014, 2016, and 2017. So there is a traceability of the process of how this annotation has evolved over time. So I will not go too much into the, the blah blah of the text in there. Uh, but mainly showing that there is both the function that is reannotated, the type of catalytic activities, the type of compounds. And what you will see, and this is actually the old way that we do the annotation. Nowadays, each of these compounds will have a chemistry and a KEBI ID, so a chemical entity behind, so that people that are coming from the chemistry side could search much more easily this, which was not the case up until now because we have been not really much more inclined to do chemistry-based, although we do biochemistry. So there's the bio and the chemistry, right? Um, so that is actually something that is actually coming up in the next year. So in the future, it's going to be much more linked data towards chemistry that you will see through in, in Swiss Prot. So each of the papers is obviously linked. Each of the evidence and the cofactors are there. The variations that are linked to the disease and the type of polymorphism and its effects actually put, also with the identifiers. In this case, the catabolism of vitamin K was not known. So we had to create, inside Go, a category for vitamin K catabolism that is led by that protein. This is actually all the evidence code that are created for that. So in this way, it's a Swiss product curator that created the Go annotation that is then used and distributed by Go and actually used as well by us in Swissport. So the value of collaboration and coordination amongst resources. And whenever possible, we link that also to some resources. This is actually the omen for the Mendelian inheritance at the NIH, at the NCBI, sorry, uh, for the Cumarin resistance, where actually the first discovery was actually done there. The functional characterization, then, you link each of the variants. There is one thing, is where, as much as possible, we try to use ontologies for this. This is actually saying what is the effect of the variation. And for those of you that works with variation of human, most of them are what is called VUS, variant of unknown significance. We know it varies, but we don't know what it does. And in this case, it decreases the effect of the protein. Right? That mutations. So the unit entries are basically regularly updated with new information. The only the publication that provides relevant information are added. 
Publications are read in details and fully curated, so it's not reading just the abstract, it's a full curation. Other publications can be found on the edition of bibliography, and these ones are always put as in the what I call the me-too category, the additional one. Now, just to, to finish, sorry, just take a bit. You'll have the slides in any case afterwards, I, I give that. Just to give you a, a bit of a number for the people that are more on the text mining, there's 253 papers that are indexed in PubMed for this prototype. 15 have been used for the annotation. So they have been selected, so only a fraction of them. Now that comes to what you said earlier, is that not, we are not interested in anything but the protein function. So we have a very focused view. So it might be very important for others that other paper would be selected. So that means we are, and we will not be comprehensively covering every topics related to the, to the, uh, to that gene in all kind of conditions. Here it's really a protein centric view, but only four of them have valuable information. So that means there is 11 that do not add really new knowledge. They are important, they are identified as important, but they do not add knowledge. So it's four out of 253. So other publications were either not relevant for the Uniprat or presented redundant, redundant or weaker evidence. So these ones, for example, this is important for people that do pharmacogenetics because it's actually influenced the quality of long-term anticoagulation treatment. That's important for them. But it's not really that critical for a Uniprot entry. So it would not make out of the 15 or 4 papers. So the number of publications curated is of course important, these 8,000, but it is uh, as important to select the paper that provides the maximum high quality information to make the best use of our resource. The resource of a curator is very pricey and you don't want to waste it. You want to use it as best as possible. And in the next few minutes, I'll really tackle the aspects of, uh, of how do we try to optimize the use of our curators. Well, this is the slide that everybody shows, I think, in, in any good literature mining uh, uh, talk, and, I, and it stops at 2014. It goes on in exponential, and, and this is actually the line of Swissprot. The red one. <clears throat> so you look at that and you say, well, you lose the battle. Um, how many do we evaluate? Uh, all this, this violet stuff? How many are curatable? All this? And honestly, a few years ago, I could guesstimate, made a few guesses, but the NIH was not really that happy with that guess. Or actually, the scientific advisory, it's not really the NIH, the scientific advisory board was not really that, that keen on saying, well, we know that you're doing a good job, but we want to know how good you're really doing your good job. Show us that any of the, of the literature triage might help. So that's where we actually work with the group of Ziong uh, at the NCBI, and it's been the work that has been led by Sylvain Pou with curator from each and every of the sites, trying to actually <laughs> know how bad or how good are we. And if I'm showing that, obviously, we always give the positive spin, right? We know that we are doing a good job, but there, that was really something which gave us confidence that I could give the example of CYP4, uh, the, CYP to the cytochrome P4, uh, F, CYP4F easily, but that's one case. We want to have that generally, right? Now, this paper actually allowed us to do one thing which was quite useful. One is to approach the problem of expert curation and see if I'm using a technology such as the peptata from Ziong, are we optimizing the selection of papers? Are we doing anything better than if we were doing that just by ourselves? And this is actually kind of a plot which is a bit complicated, but on the other side it's trying to say the expert curation will actually select those are the curatable sections. So those would be all the papers that we consider to be curated and have value for SwissProt. There's a lot that are redundant, insufficient evidence, and review commentaries. We never take the review commentaries because those ones do not have the first line of evidence of a given proteins. They are review commentaries, so they are overviews. A lot of them are out of scope, actually. But the good thing is with the expert curation and the literature triage, we could actually demonstrate that a lot of the papers are in the curatable section, and we optimize our process through that means. 
If we were actually doing a ran purely random sampling, very little curatable. And by random sampling, I have to put a word of caution, is you, you take a period and you hope that it's random. But if you fit on the CRISPR-Cas9 discovery period, you're in trouble, right? So basically, all this is, is taking into account the fact that the, the random is, a, is the one that I would, I would put a grain of salt on this. The journal monitoring is something that we've been seeing as efficient, but the Peptator improved the efficiency very much. And that's actually where the mix between curation and literature mining and linked data is actually useful for us to optimize our process because ultimately our curator's times are essential. In conclusion, we really need to identify this middle ground between the manual and expert curation and the text mining and the machine learning techniques. High quality resources are essential. I think most of the people acknowledge the fact that SwissProt is a high quality resource. Um, also because for the last 30 years, we received funding for maintaining it to that quality. And, and also because we prevent ourselves from doing research alone. We are only collaborating with groups that do research, typically the group of Zion, or Lars or Fabio or others are doing research. We are doing service to provide the service to a higher level. And that's what we are paid for doing when we maintain something like SwissProt. Um, and it's really serving this high quality resource as a training and assessment for machine learning, for developing new methods. And I guess during this day, we'll hear a lot about using this kind of, of resource to train systems and not talk to use this kind of technologies. And there is also a need to evolve with the community needs. And I think that's the thing which was not really the case 10 or 15 years ago. I would say the community was small enough and the use of our resource was small enough that we didn't need to talk to other people outside. Now, a lot of the resource I'm talking about here today are using other type of resource like agricultural, uh, environmental and other type of fields we were not actually trained to engage with. And I think that's part of the thing where we as a resource provider need to actually go out and talk much more to, uh, to the outside. With that, I'd like to finish with the funding. And it looks like the, the Formula One Grand Prix uh, logo. Uh, the vast majority of the funding from the Swiss Institute of, of, of Bioinformatics comes from the Swiss government. The NIH is funding a large fraction of it. Some of the framework program from the EU uh, that was for, that's for the vital IT side, which I haven't talked to today about, which is more the high performance computing and the competence center in bioinformatics, which I'm happy to discuss uh, over beer and, and other things. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>